Your point about the weapons of mass destruction, I can remember sitting next when I was still in the military, and the weapons of mass destruction had not been found. And sitting next to Newt Gingrich, as he spoke at the National Defense University, and afterwards I asked him, what do you say now to the public that they haven't been found? And the answer was, we'll give them another reason. And so the cost also, though, to us Americans, is the fact that we now have studies that show the cost of this war is not just $1 trillion that has been spent up front, but possibly as much as $2 trillion to our wonderful veterans, and that also is out there, that do serve us, but that they've come home with post-traumatic stress disorder. One out of every four homeless is a veteran. Two out of every five veterans' families are on food stamps. And so this has been a tragic misadventure, but the lesson cannot be forgotten, that it's not just military advice that's most important in deciding whether and how to conduct a war. It is also, how does it affect our overall fabric of national security? And that was lost, as we just kept saying, do it, and do it, and do it, rather than reassess it. This point about military advice is interesting, and I want to ask you this as someone who served quite high up. You were a three-star admiral, if I'm not mistaken, in the Navy. Is that right? Is that right? One of the things I think that we've seen in the years since the war began is this notion that we should listen to the generals on the ground. There is this kind of seeding of the political question of whether we should be involved in the war to the strategic or tactical question of how best to engage in whatever military work we are doing at that moment. What do you think the legacy has been coming out of this in terms of how we think about the politics of war? Ultimately, we as a democracy, how we choose to fight a war and not outsource those questions to... I think this is one of the greatest lessons we have to walk away from this conflict with, is that military advice is merely a piece, an important but a piece, of how we go about the national security decision of going into war and how to conduct it. As some great military thinker once said, war is really politics by other means. It's why Franklin Delano Roosevelt kept his hand very strongly on how and when we entered World War II and was intrigued with ensuring the right diplomatic outcome. It's why General Eisenhower said Korea has to stop. And it's why John F. Kennedy said after the Bay of Pigs and that fiasco, I will never again take aboard solely the military expert advice and the intelligence. And so the failure across the board in Congress and in the administration to say this, how is this affecting our national security, our leadership in the world, our impact at home, how we might, could not defend South Korea with our army. Those aspects were totally missing. I think the overarching issue here is militaries can stop a problem. They cannot fix a problem. That's an interesting point. And when you really go out there, particularly in something that you make as this global war terror, it is ultimately about the hearts and the minds. Absolutely. And militaries can and do train to do that. But by and large, it's the other elements of our national power, working with other cultures that ultimately brings about a society that we can, that's stable and can go forward. Absolutely. Secretary Gates said it well, anyone who thinks we should ever get into another intervention on the land mass of Asia should have his mind examined. Yeah. Particularly for an occupation, because in the longer term, it gets to the point that while around this world, and you made this, this issue, brought it up, is that we're respected for the power of our military, for the power of our economy, but we are admired for the power of our ideals. And that slowly, particularly since we went there with almost a made-up purpose, takes that greatest strength of ours away. When I commanded the aircraft carrier battle group off Afghanistan, I had 30 ships. Only 10 were United States ships. Japan had left the Sea of Japan for the first time since World War II was in the battle group. We had ships and Greeks. We had led an international coalition of when we're most strong. But the overarching point here to what you had kind of brought up about Iraq is that we normally go to war when there's a clear and present danger. There was really no problem to stop in Iraq. There was no clear and present and, danger. Correct. And so it became a tragic misadventure militarily because we divided our forces rather than completing potentially Afghanistan, which it treated and went south quickly. On the other hand, we went into something that I think we created 
And without this international support, less than 10% of our troops were non-U.S., different than Bosnia, different than the first Iraq war. And if you do go to conflict, we are best served if the international community that we lead is with us. Well, I think what I know now is that we didn't learn the lessons of the Vietnam War well enough. And when I joined up as the war was dwindling down in Vietnam, the military leadership wanted to make sure that we regained the confidence of the public, and if we went to war, they went with us. I think we did that, but we also wanted to make sure that the military leadership in the Pentagon, not out there in the fleet, would make sure they gave honest, candid advice, so much so that General Shelton, President Clinton's last term of the Joint Chiefs Staff, passed out a book, Dereliction of Duty, showing how they didn't do it right in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. You saw General Shen Shekhi gave his candid advice, pushed to the side. Is that the lesson that our military how they proffered their advice, conscious of what may happen to them personally, when that's the lesson we want to learn from Vietnam, that our military leadership is one that gives candid advice about the implications of war. And I didn't know that maybe we didn't learn that lesson well enough.